Welcome everyone back to the damage. When I'm John Arola, this is not just a day in news. This is a day in the middle of the complete breakdown of the justice system in multiple areas. Too much has been happening, none of it good. I'm trying to think if I missed something, but I don't think I have. The world is in chaos, it's burning up and the courts won't stop. And so we decided we're gonna bring someone on to help us break this down. So we're very lucky to be joined on the show by Adrian Lawrence. Adrian, how's it going? Hi, you know, I'm doing the best I can during this kind of intellectual apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, you, um, you're you the host of Overruled. Yes, can you and just, I've been busy. Can you overrule any of this, please? <laughs> like Unfortunately, I, like I, I don't have that power. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we've got a lot of different stuff that we're gonna delve into. Just briefly though, um, we responded to the breaking news about Bill Cosby yesterday. And we assumed, oh, that's gonna be the big thing that sucks that we all have to deal with. And obviously that was just the first of many things, some of which we're gonna break down. But um, and I know that you, uh, I was reading your tweets and you read the entire decision. Yeah, so I I, I'm just curious, like, as you're basically the only expert that I've actually talked about this. I've expressed my opinions, I've absorbed tons of them. Um, do you have a different reaction to any of the stuff yesterday as a result of your background and the reading of the decision? Um, let's see, so uh, particularly when it comes to Bill Cosby or like all of sure. the stuff from yesterday. Uh, let's, let's start with the Bill Cosby here. Uh, so with regard to Bill Cosby, you know, it just feels like this is one of those unfortunate seminal points in time where courts decide to make new law. They decide to make a rule that benefits the masses. And an unfortunate aspect of that means that someone who is more than likely very culpable is going to go free. And so it was a big day for survivors, for individuals who believe in justice, um, to try to balance that sense of justice because you know you want courts to get it right, but at the same time you want bad people to be locked up. And mm -hmm. in this situation, we couldn't have both. Yeah. So, but 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 according to their logic, they they did have a point or whatever about the process that put him in jail. Uh, yes, you know the point really is that prosecutors cannot essentially promise not to prosecute you and usher you or encourage you to go testify without your Fifth Amendment right, which is what happens when you're in a civil suit. And that's what happened here, where Bill Cosby essentially was facing a prosecutor with potential criminal charges, and the prosecutor said, "I'm not going to prosecute you. You can move on your way." And then there was a civil suit brought against Bill Cosby, where he doesn't have a right to say, "I'm not going to testify under the Fifth Amendment." And so he ended up making statements in that civil suit. And then a prosecutor comes right behind him and says, I'm gonna take those statements now and prosecute you in fact. And so this is good that the court said, you know what, prosecutors can't do that. When they give you mm -hmm. their promise, it has to stick. And so that's good for individuals moving forward when it comes to our individual rights as accused. But at the same time, it does mean Bill Cosby goes free. Okay, that, that's, that's fair, well taken, but I have a follow-up question. Yeah. Why couldn't they get him on any of the other stuff? I mean, like, that guy is like record breaking in the crimes that he's apparently committed over so long. There's so many women. Yeah. How, how did it come down to one prosecutor who was like, whatever, I don't care, I'm not gonna do anything? Like, how did it come down to that? How did they not just, oh, okay, so we can't get you on that one? Well, there's 50 plus other women. Like, what? How does the system not have any way of getting at him. I love that you brought up that point. Uh, because in giving my analysis, and I posted an overruled video on this, uh, my analysis is limited to this case, which was a prosecution for uh, sexually assaulting Andrea Constant, that one individual. And so it doesn't include all of the other women who come forward. It doesn't analyze their cases. It doesn't have anything to do with their cases. The court has to limit its focus. And that's also what I limited my focus to, that in this particular instance, Andrea Constand was the victim here that sustained the conviction. And because of the circumstances, he has to go free. The reason that the prosecutors aren't necessarily going to bring charges again using any of the other women's stories is because of the statute of limitation. Oftentimes, it's already, it's already lapsed. And so we did see post Me Too, we saw a number of states passing laws to say that, you know what, we're gonna remove the statute of limitations here. Because there were a lot of events that happened decades ago that people are now just essentially mustering the courage 
sure. because of how our society shames people. They're, they're ready to come forward or to speak up. But because there were statute of limitations set saying maybe only had 10 years, that time has since lapsed. And so that's yeah. why prosecutors are unable to pursue the other women's cases, in addition to the fact that the evidence may not be there. And you know, this was a second trial for Bill Cosby. So people are already questionable when it's just a he said, she said situation. Yeah. Although, as was pointed out by a comedian that I retweeted, it's like she said it's a classic case of he said, she said, she said, she said, she said, she said, she said and then you just go on until you run out of characters. Um, I want to ask you one more question, and I swear we're going to get to a rundown. This isn't on a rundown, I'm just fascinated and I want to yeah. use Adrian's um, expertise while we have it. Um, I know that I'm I, like, I'm, you know, a person who talks at a YouTube camera about politics, so I'm supposed to believe that everything I believe is totally right and totally founded, especially white males tend to have that proclivity, but I, but I don't. I want to, I want to learn. So, statutes of limitations, yeah. should, should that exist? Like, is there, is there a case to be made? Cause it seems like it's kind of just a way to get out from justice, like I, but, but again, I'm not an expert. So what do you think about it? Okay, so um, statute of limitations, and for anyone who's unfamiliar with that term, uh, that's the period of time that you can bring a claim, a suit, or a criminal conviction. So if it's three years, you can't do it after that. Um, and when it comes to how our society has set up the statute of limitations, of course, because white men have run the game, white men have set the statute of limitations for certain crimes. For murder, there is no statute of limitations. You can always be held accountable because murder is so heinous. It's what they call a malay and say type crime. That's a Latin term. That means it's inherently wrong. You don't need a statute to tell you don't murder. It's the same thing with rape. But unfortunately, hey, you've got legislature out there who says, no, we'll give you 10 years to come forward. Until then, good luck. And so that becomes problematic because again, as we mentioned, Society has not been welcoming, particularly of women to come forward, where there were even allowances for years to essentially slut shame or to blame the victim. And also juries, which are a representation of society, were unwilling to convict rapists unless it was something that involved heinous physical force. It depended also mm -hmm. on the race of the victim. For a long time, it's been held and continue is. The fact that thought that black women could not be raped because we are not innocent by definition. And so there were so many reasons people weren't coming forward. And thus these statute of limitation bars become problematic when people are ready. Not innocent by nature? Yes, that is something that is long held. And that's why in part black women are hypersexualized. And so yeah, there was there's a time and there are also opinions out there where they'd say you can't rape a black woman. It's impossible. Uh, because it's the thought that oh, we are sexualized Jezebels. And so unfortunately, that's a stereotype that continues to play out. Uh, and why oftentimes black women will not come forward with sexual assaults because it's the thought that we were never victims to begin with. Uh, a lot of these stereotypes will follow all sorts of groups uh, in some way that will prevent them from seeking justice because what's the point when you're not gonna get it? Yeah, wow, okay, well, thank you for all that, I, I do appreciate that. There's a lot that we're gonna be getting to through the course of our show today. Thank you everyone for being here. Please hit the like button, share the stream if you haven't already so that people know we're live as we launch into this rundown. And we will be responding during our breaks to your comments, tweets, super chats, all of that as we always do. Early heads up, by the way, that after the show, you can of course tune in to Indisputable with Dr. Rashad Ritchie. That is coming up right afterward. Malika Jabali is gonna be the co-host, senior news and politics editor for Essence, who you've seen a couple times on the damage report, is gonna be the co-host for the show with Dr. Rashad. Carrie Sheffield, a conservative, will be appearing as well, as well as Dr. Pamela Gurley. So big show coming up after this, but first, the damage report. So let's jump into some of this news. There's too much. I'm just gonna say that in advance. There's too much. It's big news Thursday. So here we go. <clears throat> As was predicted earlier this week, the charges against the Trump org and at least one of the individuals involved there are coming. We don't know the exact content necessarily, perhaps it will break during this show. But this morning, Donald J. Trump's long serving chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, surrendered to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Prosecutors are expected to unseal an indictment later in the day against both Mr. Weisselberg and the Trump Organization. So you've you've probably heard his name in the news over the past few years, but if you haven't, he served as the Trump Organization's financial gatekeeper for more than two decades, 
and recently ran the business with Mr. Trump's adult sons by certain definitions while Mr. Trump was in the White House. So as a part of the inquiry that's been ongoing, prosecutors in the office of the district attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. have been examining whether Mr. Weisselberg failed to pay taxes on valuable benefits he and his family received from Mr. Trump, including private school tuition for at least one of his grandchildren, free apartments and leased cars. So we're expecting that that's going to be a part of what's revealed later on today. We don't know all the details yet, but we do know that according to Weisselberg's lawyers, he intends to plead not guilty and he will fight these charges in court. So Adrian, again, with, with all those, um, you know, uh, we, we don't know certain details of this. So those caveats are out there. Um, what do you think about this? What, what do you expect to come of this, if anything? Oh, I think they're trying to essentially push up on Weisselberg to get him to flip on Trump. Because generally, prosecutors do not bring charges for failure to pay taxes on fringe benefits. That is a rarity. This is pretty unprecedented. Because only when these charges are brought, it's part of a larger case. So it's kind of like an add on. So the fact that they are bringing these charges in isolation, what that tells us is the prosecutors are probably trying to get Weisselberg to flip in some way so that they can build out a larger case against Trump and Trump's organization. Yeah, um, uh, that, that makes sense to me. Uh, it's also the case that's uh, being made by the Trump organization that put out a statement saying that Mr. Weisselberg is being used as a pawn in a scorched earth attempt to harm the former president. Um, I think that's probably a part of it, certainly. I mean, certainly he's being used as a pawn insofar as they're trying to use him to get more information. Um, and I definitely think that some of the people involved in this probably wouldn't mind harming the former president. If they're rational people, they should have that as a goal in their life, I do. Um, that said, Trump organization has almost certainly broken so many laws. The thing that bothers me so far, Adrian, I don't know what you think about this, is that the stuff that they're describing, like that has to be the least significant law breaking that's going on in the Trump organization. If things are happening, paying taxes on his bends seems like a small thing in comparison to all of what at least has been alleged by people like Michael Cohen about insurance fraud and the devaluation and then overvaluation of real estate, tax issues and all that. This seems like one of the most minor things. But my question to you is, um, I, I don't know what the potential penalties for this sort of thing are. If the goal is to get him to flip, does this seem like enough potentially to do that? Considering that Donald Trump has said that Weisselberg is like 100% loyal for a long time, he would never turn on me. You know, it makes me think of Al Capone and the fact that there were a lot of things he did, but you know, he got busted on tax evasion. So, you know, the thought that someone who is engaged in far more criminality only gets busted for something little is very much a federal prosecutor's kind of way in to really get them and get them good. And so, Weisselberg, being what, I believe, 73 years old, he may actually face some kind of considerable punishment in the event that he's convicted. Because one thing we do have to consider is how many instances of the potential criminality are possible. So, even if um, this fringe benefits, it only carries, let's say, uh, possibly maybe a year in prison. Then if there are 20 instances of that, hey, you never know if a judge wants to go ahead and make it consecutive instead of concurrent, then you could spend mm -hmm. the rest of your twilight years you know, in an eight by eight cell on the bottom bunk. So the thought that Weisselberg could potentially turn on his bestie Trump, it'll be interesting, especially since we all know Trump and he could possibly turn on Weisselberg. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, just judging by the photo that that we brought up of him, he doesn't seem like he's made for spending the rest of his life in prison. That's, no. I imagine, it's tough for everyone, obviously. But um, yeah, yeah, perhaps. Wouldn't it be weird if he spends the rest of his life in jail for not paying taxes on his bends or whatever, but Cosby's <laughs> out? Well, there's what also <laughs> um, like I guess uh, there's also potential evidence that essentially his son was getting a Manhattan apartment and a full salary while we're working at the Trump Organization ice rink in Central Park. It's like there seems to be a bunch of money funneling through using these things that aren't being covered as taxes. And so, uh, you know, Weisselberg, he's been around for a long time. He probably knows where the bodies are buried and participated in burying them. He might really be like, I ain't going down for this for this sucker. No, I'll go ahead and I'll rat out. You never know. We'll see. I mean, look, I'm sure he'll want to if it'll save him. The thing is, I just I can't imagine that Trump had anything to do with any of this. 
totally clean that guy. He's not gonna get involved in financial impropriety, trying to defraud the government potentially to make money. Why? He doesn't need to, he's a billionaire. Why would he be so petty financially? <laughs> oh, wow. You know what, that's a really anyway. good point. And I also think that Weisselberg, <laughs> he could go and full Shawshank this. Like he could go into prison and just do Andy Dufresne style. You know, he could be doing taxes for guards and actually live pretty well. <laughs> Never know. It's been a very long time since I watched that, but I think I understand the reference. Ah, you're yeah. killing me, man. I know, I know. I need to rewatch it. Um, okay, now with that, uh, I've joked about what I think Trump's exposure is, but uh, what does he think? Well, while we're currently waiting to find out exactly what the charges against um, Alan Weisselberg and the Trump Organization might be, what we're not expecting, according to sources, are any charges specifically against Donald Trump. Um, because this is America, and why would you expect justice, you dummy? But anyway, um, last night when Trump was doing a uh, town hall with uh, Sean Hannity, uh, they barely even referenced the impending charges because that would require Sean Hannity have some sort of like journalistic ethics, and to believe that like impending major news is worth bringing up to the president. But anyway, um, it came up very briefly with Donald Trump listing his past legal battles. He said. New York radical left prosecutors come after me, you got to always fight, you got to keep fighting. That was as much as they talked about it. He had a former president whose organization is facing criminal charges the next day, didn't even bring it up. Sean Hannity, hell of a journalist. But anyway, that doesn't mean that he doesn't have a reaction. We just won't get it directly from him. According to Political Playbook, the former president was on a conference call on Monday with his advisors discussing his favorite topic, revenge. And by the way, the playbook doesn't go any more into detail about what they were talking about when it comes to revenge. Just revenge, like the concept, is it best served cold? I don't know, what do you think? But anyway, um, he was interrupted with an update on the investigation. He was told he would not be personally indicted, only Weisselberg and the Trump Organization. Trump was thrilled by what he saw as light charges. And according to one of the advisors on the call, his mind raced to 2024. Just wait until 2024, you'll see. The former president implied that the legal case would be seen as a political witch hunt that would backfire on Democrats. This is going to hurt Sleepy Joe. So what do you know? He interpreted news events as being beneficial to him and thinks that everything is a is a witch hunt. How weird, I never saw that coming. But is this is this a win, Adrian? I mean, every every source that I'm seeing says they could like whether he is never charged or not. The organization could be caught up in legal troubles that would be time consuming and consume a lot of money. They say it could potentially bring down the corporation. That seems bad. I don't know. What do you think? Well, it's funny because, you know, bringing down the Trump corporation, it's like how many of Trump's corporations have ever stood up? You know, a lot of them are bankrupt mm -hmm. anyways. So, kind of almost shoulder shrugs. Uh, if anything, it'll just make one less potential channel for Trump to, you know, funnel money through and not pay the taxes on. Um, you know, I, you know, Trump, he always likes to self-aggrandize and just say, "Oh, it didn't hurt. It's no big deal." Uh, I do appreciate that these are lower-level charges, and on first glance, I'm sure Trump thought it's a win. But he's an absolute fool if he thinks that there's not going to be more, and that this is not setting him up in some way to potentially lose Weisselberg as mm. someone on his side. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It like it, it reeks of like to to use a really outdated analogy. It reeks of like The Simpsons with the pig flying. It's still good. It's still good. It's it's still it goes good. into like a slime infested river. I, it like Trump, man, he will eat that pig, metaphorically and literally. Um, but anyway, um, so here is something that I'm just gonna add one extra detail from playbook that makes it even sadder. So. My belief, and I think my preference as a person who can only take so much cringiness, um, I can get through most of Scott's tots, but I, I, I fast forward through a bit of it. My preference was that Trump and his theories about becoming president again, like in two months, is a is a grift. He doesn't believe it. He's just telling that to his to the rubes to get them to give him money and all that. That would be bad enough. According to these sources that talk to Politico. It's worse because the aide who says now he's definitely going to run for president again, as if that was ever in question, goes on to say, um, let's see, uh, it's a witch hunt, it's gonna anger his supporters. Aides say that his interest in the case pales in comparison to his obsession with the idea that he could still prove to be the winner of the 2020 election. 
His world is seriously consumed by that, said a Trump advisor. In comparison to election fraud, the DA's investigation is not even close. They say he's even questioned the merits of the Constitution if it can't be used to investigate election fraud. So it being a grift is sad. Him really believing that the Arizona cyber ninja thing is gonna make him president by August is so much sadder that I, I almost hope that the aides are just saying it to make him look bad. I don't wanna believe that a person could actually believe that. A grown adult who served in government as president could believe that, yeah, we're gonna cruise into Halloween with President Trump again. I don't know how you believe that, Adrian. Any final thoughts? Oh, you know, I've always wondered, is Trump really just practicing like the secret? Where he thinks as long as I believe it, it's gonna come true. Cuz that's how I've rationalized it. I'm like, wow, he's got some strong game when it comes to the secret. Like he's out here manifesting some stuff. Cuz that, that, that has to be what's going on here. Otherwise, it's just not in any way logical. <laughs> Don't worry, Ivanka, I've got this. I'm putting a little cutout of Arizona on the vision board. It's all gonna come up Trumpy. Yeah, maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Um, in any event, uh, outside of Trump's legal concerns, we've got the Supreme Court, which is coming out with a whole bunch of stuff, basically none of it good. And we'll be breaking that down after this. Okay, Adrian, let's check in with the Supreme Court. Are they awesome? Are they villains? I don't know, let's find out together. The Supreme Court is closing out their session with a couple of rulings that are just awesome for democracy. We talked earlier this week about them picking up a couple different provisions of Arizona state law that had limited people's ability to, you know, like get a little bit wrong about their ballot or potentially have someone else be involved in handing it in. We'll give you more details. That decision has now come down. Six to three, the Supreme Court is upholding the suppressive Arizona voting laws. That's awesome. It was the court's first consideration of how a crucial part of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 applies to voting restrictions that have a disproportionate impact on members of minority groups. The larger message of the ruling was that the Voting Rights Act hobbled after the Supreme Court in 2013, effectively struck down its central provision, retains only limited power to combat voting restrictions said to disproportionately affect minority voters access to the polls. This particular case, Brnovich versus the DNC concerned two kinds of voting restrictions. One required election officials to discard ballots cast at the wrong precinct. Uh, why? Because those people are not citizens or whatever? No, no, because it's just convenient to be able to get rid of them at that point. Uh, the other made it a crime for campaign workers, community activists, and most other people to collect ballots for delivery to polling places, a practice critics call uh, ballot harvesting. The law made exceptions for family members, caregivers, and election officials. Uh, the people who are challenging the law say that both of these provisions uh, disproportionately impact uh, voters who aren't white, and that is not even really disputed by the Supreme Court. But what do you know, the super the super majority of conservatives on there don't seem that aggrieved by it. They don't seem to mind it so much. So Adrian, take it away. How do you like your Supreme Court? Oh, um, you know what, they're doing exactly what they're intended to do, uh, which is really to suppress the vote and to continue to uphold the power structures. You know, we have a majority conservative Supreme Court, and unless we expand it or do something, we're going to continue to see rulings like this. You know, we've seen voting rights completely be under attack within this last year because, hey, people in power don't want to lose their power, predominantly white men. And so as a result of that, what they're doing is suppressing the vote of people of color, of women, of people who are in marginalized positions in society and have more hurdles to get their vote counted. And it just, it really says the fact that we are not a democracy or to the extent we are, we are a democracy exactly as it was intended to be originally where it's white male landowners who have a right to vote and who have a say in this country. Yeah, yeah. and. I mean, we we know why they initially passed them. We know why they chose these Supreme Court justices. We know why the justices are ruling in this way. It is all designed to produce an outcome, which is, I'm I'm not gonna say like a thing that biases the system towards electing Republicans that's out of step with their actual approval out there, you know, amongst the populace. That's it's just yet another one of those things. Let's just make it worse, you know. Um, but that's what they're doing. 
Uh, back in 2016, black, Latino, and Native American voters were about twice as likely to cast ballots in the wrong precinct as were white voters. And by the way, if you're a, a white conservative, bear in mind, they're totally cool with throwing out some of your ballots too. They don't give a damn about you, so long as there's way more not yous that are being thrown out. So it's like when they, you know, they'll go into an area and they'll make it so you need voter ID, but not like college ID. That doesn't do it. They know that they're gonna disenfranchise some young Republicans, those sad sacks. So they just know that they're gonna disenfranchise more not young Republicans. So you should be offended by this. You won't be because I don't think you fundamentally care that much about democracy, but in theory, you could be. At this point, I wanna ask you one other question, Adrian, because there's other details about this. But my fear is that this, this is bad on its own, but it's also a signal that we're ending six months of multiple states trying to crack down on voting in as many ways as possible. Huge substantive ones, incredibly petty ones, everything they can do. This seems like a Supreme Court that is gonna be pretty deferential to these states efforts to do this. Especially when in this decision, they say that they don't even necessarily need to prove that it's done to combat voter fraud. They can just be scared of it whether it's happening or not and they can do whatever they want effectively. I feel like they're gonna uphold a lot of these laws that are that are being challenged. Some already have been, the DOJ is gonna be looking to Georgia, but what's the point if the Supreme Court is just gonna uphold it anyway? Exactly, and this is just signaled it's an invitation to states to continue to promulgate these voting restrictions to essentially suppress the vote of marginalized groups so that white male dominance can continue to reign in our legislative process. And it's very unfortunate that this is the route SCOTUS is going. Also, um, you know, it's like having this conservative bench up there with those six justices who really continue to push the Republican agenda. It is going to shape significantly, really, uh, the demographics, the vote, the culture, everything about our nation. And so, as much as people may think, oh, this decision uh, doesn't affect me, as you kind of just indicated. The reality is that it's going to affect you down the line in your future. And so anybody who has any kind of democratic principles or progressive ideologies, they need to continue to fight because what happens to us as black people, as women, it will happen to you. We are the canaries in the coal mine. So when we scream about it, there's only a matter of time before it impacts you. So you might as well speak up now before it gets to that point. You're 100% right. Yeah, and I mean, there's a reason they're doing it in the states they're doing it. They want to take those narrow victories that Biden had, flip those. They, they know that they're not gonna become more popular, like get more voters to support them. They just wanna make it so it doesn't matter. Um, and if they can do that, and if they can win the Electoral College that way, well then they haven't changed the laws in California or New York or whatever. But it, your vote no longer really counts if you can't win elections because they've so manipulated and rigged the system in some states. So everyone should be engaged in this fight. Now that said, that was not the only thing this, the Supreme Court did. The Supreme Court also came out with a decision when it came to donor disclosure. This was yet another uh, divided Supreme Court decision. They invalidated a California requirement that charities list the names and addresses of their top donors in filings with the state. Saying the rule violates the Constitution's First Amendment. It was a, what do you know, 6 3 ruling, a victory for two conservative groups, the Thomas More Law Center and the Charles Koch backed Americans for Prosperity Foundation, that said the California rule puts their donors at risk of harassment and intimidation. And if you don't know anything more, you might think, well, yeah, I mean, if you have to list their addresses, that could, no, it's just the state, it's not public. They're not giving it out to everyone. They say, well, yeah, but like in theory, it could be released at some point. That's our concern, we're just worried about the harassment. It's not that we wanna make sure that people feel free to give us tons and tons of money to manipulate electoral outcomes and all that. We're just worried about the first amendment and everything. So California says it keeps the information confidential, but that didn't matter to the Supreme Court and they haven't validated it. And I believe they specifically did it for California, but there are other states that have similar sorts of requirements. In theory, I don't see how those stand if the Supreme Court has invalidated it in one state. So. More good news from the Supreme Court, Adrian. Yep, and I remember when this case, uh, SCOTUS decided to accept it, and I did an overruled um, episode on it in January. And the thing is, it's a Coke-backed effort. You know, all the money in the world and pushing for dark money, 
to continue to control our democracy. And that's exactly what happened here. And because we have this conservative majority court, this is just, you know, it was it was a strike right up their alley and they knocked it out of the park in terms of continuing to push the Republican agenda to the point where we're going to see so many more elections, Democrats and Republicans funded by dark money that are problematic and that shouldn't yeah. be the case. Yeah. And um, you know, as we were talking about in the last one, that in theory, you know, this signals a, an approach to election like suppression laws. Um, this certainly seems to signal an approach towards disclosure. Disclosure, by the way, is supposed to be like if you're worried about like the corrosive influence of money on politics, um, yeah, too bad. We're never gonna limit it, but we'll give you some disclosure. How about that? We'll let infinite money flood in. But maybe once every 20 years we'll pass a law that like mildly reveals a little bit of it. They're not even gonna do that anymore. They're gonna be knocking it down. You don't have to trust me. One of the dissenting justices, Sonia Sotomayor said, today's analysis marks reporting and disclosure requirements with a bullseye. Regulated entities who wish to avoid their obligations can do so by vaguely waving towards First Amendment privacy concerns. Even when again, there wasn't a privacy concern, the information was still private. But but that was enough for the Supreme Court to get rid of disclosure. So if you can get rid of it when it comes to nonprofits in California, can't the same case be made for virtually every other form of disclosure? The fact that I can go on Open Secrets and I can find out who donated and how much and all that. Well, maybe they they have to be worried about disclosure or they have to be worried about privacy rights too. I don't know. Maybe not. Maybe Kavanaugh will surprise me or whatever, <laughs> and some others as well. But so far, it looks like. Yeah, it looks like disclosure is also going on the chopping block. Yep, people do not want to actually have to face the consequences for their actions. They want to be able to say one thing to us and then secretly behind closed doors fund and funnel money to other entities and organizations that stand in absolute opposition to what the things that they that they're saying. So, yeah. it's just more hypocrisy. It is. It is. Okay, um, let's see. We're going to take our next break a little bit early because this next story uh, having to do with the uh, undercover video of the Exxon executive is, is kind of a doozy. So we're gonna take a break, but stick around, important stuff after this. Okay, let's jump into one of the spiciest stories we've got on the rundown for today. Good bit of video coming up, but it's important stuff. So Adrian, let's jump into this. Exxon Mobil loves behind the scenes to manipulate things. But what about when those behind the scenes moments are no longer behind the scenes? Greenpeace UK's investigative platform Unearth posed as headhunters. To obtain inf information from one of ExxonMobil's most senior Washington lobbyists. So, this is Keith McCoy, senior ExxonMobil lobbyist on Capitol Hill, has represented the company um, with the, the, the Congress for eight years and is talking shockingly openly and freely with these, uh, these headhunters. So, we got a lot of different stuff that he's going to reveal about ExxonMobil, reveal about US senators. Reveal about the way they use narratives to try to ward off substantive change. So we got a few videos. Let's jump into this first one. Did we aggressively fight yeah. against um, uh, some of the science? Yeah. Uh, yes. Did we join some of these shadow groups yeah. uh, to work against uh, some of the early efforts? Yes, that's mm -hmm. true. Um, but there's nothing, there's nothing illegal about that. Yeah. Um, you know, we were looking out for our investments. We mm. were looking out for our, our in uh, uh, our shareholders. Okay, so um, what he says there, Adrian, seems uh, perfectly accurate. The sort of lobbying that he's saying there, the the shady behind the scenes organizations, the openly denying science. Even knowing that the denial of that could influence politics that results in destruction of property, people dying and all that is very much not illegal in America, which seems like the point. And it seems like kind of the problem. We've got more video, but what did you think about that first little taste? Um, I agree with you in terms of it not being illegal in the United States, but also being a problem. You know, when we have contracts with one another, there is an implied duty on both people's behalf to use their best efforts to operate in good faith. And that's something that's read into every contract, whether it's there or not. 
So it's not like the law in some way can't see the fact that we expect people to act good. And the thing is, it's like with ExxonMobil, just because there was no law expressly banning it, there should be an implicit law that says you need not do shady things so that you can continue to financially benefit. Mm -hmm. But then again, I don't think that anyone's really gonna enforce that. Yeah, and the thing is, like the way he describes it is just, well, we have to look out for our interests. So, you know, we're gonna like deny a little science or whatever. And the thing is, like, uh, so they're, they're selling a product. Um, basically, everyone who sells products lies about them. Like, they lie about the effect that it's gonna have, uh, they lie about how good it is or whatever. Um, the issue is that some products are more consequential than others. And, uh, you know, one of the chief ways that we generate and consume energy is quite consequential, we are finding out. I mean, the, the heat dome right now of the Pacific Northwest, it's like something like more than 500 unexpected deaths just in the last week, pretty consequential to them. The result of some of this long term heating um, of the globe, but they just have to look after their interests. And the issue is not so much their, their private stuff or even just their lying ads and stuff like that. It's that they have a fairly direct influence on politics. And one of the ways they do that is through their access to politicians, which he's gonna talk about in this next video. When you have an opportunity to talk to a member of Congress, you know, the, 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 you know it's, it's, I, I, I liken it to fishing, right? You, you, you know, you have bait, you throw that bait out, you know, it's all these opportunities that, that you use. That, and, and to use the fishing analogy again, just to kind of reel them in, we've got this issue. Uh, we need Congressman so and so to be able to either introduce this bill. We need him to make a floor statement. We need him to send a letter. Yeah. You name it, we've asked for everything. Joe Manchin, I talk to his office every week. Um, he is the kingmaker, uh, and, and he's not shy about sort of staking his claim early yeah. and completely changing the debate. Legal declarations show that Senator Manchin has received tens of thousands of dollars from ExxonMobil and its trade associations. Keith McCoy names 10 other senators as crucial to ExxonMobil. Senators Mark Kelly, Chris Coons, Shelley Moore Capito, Kirsten Sinema, John Tester, Maggie Hassan, John Barrasso, Steve Daines, John Cornyn, and Marco Rubio, all bar Kelly and Hassan, have taken money from Exxon, totaling $117,000. Which, as we always need to in these cases, let's just point out, they are bought for the most pathetic sums of money imaginable. Considering how much they spend, those are senators, it's not state legislators or something. You can buy them so cheap, and that's Curse of Cinema. The former, wasn't she in the Green Party back in the day? Mm -hmm. She's supposed to be the real, she's a progressive. She just disagrees with some of us. Um, so there, look, Manchin apparently is one of the worst. He says he talks to him constantly. He, he's gotten like $12,000 and that is apparently all it takes for weekly. Do you get to talk to a senator every week? Anybody watching this get to call up a senator? Apparently it isn't that expensive. Or maybe it's that it's not about the donations necessarily, it's about future opportunities. If Manchin ever wants to leave or if he needs family members to get a job, far more than $12,000 could be on the line for some of these people. Adrian? Absolutely, yep, there are board positions waiting. You know what, it's just, it's so incredible how corrupt our system is, yet how much we legitimize the corruption of saying, oh no, that's how you're supposed to do it. When really, it's effectively a form of bribery. And it just, it's not in any way helpful to our democracy, yet people continue to uplift it. This system is just entirely whack. 100%. And the one of the things that's frustrating me is, uh, this was a this is a good sized story, right? Like people people talked about this. I don't know about on like CNN or MSNBC yeah. or whatever. I don't know. Um, wouldn't you think Fox like would be all look at this? It's a Democrat is dealing, but he, they don't want to rock the boat when this comes up. First of all, there were some Republicans that were on that list, um, and all of them are doing it for some industries. This should be like the big story of the month. This and legitimately the Cosby thing, because that's appalling in every way imaginable. He's just admitting it. He's just saying it. He's got that access, and we know how consequential it is. We know the result of it, and he's admitting all of it. And it's not gonna matter. It's gonna be forgotten in a couple of days. Joe Manchin 
maybe we'll get a question about it. Maybe at one point a journalist, I don't know who, I doubt Tap will bring it up. It, honestly, it'll probably be Chris Wallace if anyone at this point will bring it up and that'll be it. That won't be it for the relationship. He'll still be taking those weekly calls and it'll still have an effect on legislation that's currently pending. But Jesus. Jesus. This video that's been revealed of the Exxon lobbyist isn't just about what they've done in the past, the decades of denying the science and all of that. It's also about the future, dealing with the fact that Joe Biden has made some promises when it comes to climate change. So let's talk about that. He addresses it in the video. Exxon was also fighting to strip out spending on climate. Forget that, it lobbied. Stick to roads and bridges. So that's a completely different conversation. When you start when you start to stick to roads and bridges, and instead of a two trillion dollar bill, it's an eight hundred billion dollar bill. If if you lower that threshold, you stick to highways and bridges, then a lot of the the negative stuff starts to come out. Why would you put in a uh, uh, something on uh, uh, emissions reductions on climate change uh, to oil refineries in a highway bill? So, and, and people say, yeah, that doesn't make any sense. So that, so you, then you get to the germanist saying that shouldn't be in this bill. Okay, so yeah, uh, and by the way, um, what was the conversation when the the bill was initially talked about and we found out what was going to be in it? It was about this isn't about physical infrastructure. It should be more specific and all that, and that was largely driven by by right wingers, but that was a narrative. And remember, it's not like they're just giving to cinema and mansion, they're giving to basically all the Republicans too. Um, so this is how it's done. Biden makes some promises, he maybe even puts out an initial outline of what the bill is gonna look like that might include some of that stuff. And then the lobbyists get involved because they have infinitely more access, more financial influence over this process because of all of that fishing that they've done over the years using bait. Which means bribes, legalized bribes, that's all it means. And apparently he thinks at least that it's working when it comes to what's gonna be one of the biggest pieces of legislation in this presidential term. Yep, and I don't doubt that at all, you know, and especially it's just so incredibly important to hold these people accountable for all the things going on, you know, with Canada right now and their heat. They just reported 486 deaths in, I believe, the Great Britain area. Like there are issues. Uh, Exxon was just fined 14 point, I think, 25 million by a Texas federal judge for violating the Clean Air Act. Like these things need to be addressed because the reality is that we are going to suffer as individuals while they continue to pocket money. And we can't allow that to happen because it's our future, it's the environment. It's not something we can necessarily get back. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, one last aspect I want to talk about, the, about this is about uh, a carbon tax. So. Um, generally, one of the things that these companies will do is they will uh, delay and delay and delay as long as possible. They'll spend decades, um, you know, fighting the science and all that, uh, trying to deny it, and then they'll come up with some stuff that they find to be acceptable and preferable to actually dealing with the problem. So they say that they're supportive of a carbon tax and all that. Um, in 2018, they touted their investment of one million dollars over two years into a carbon tax advocacy campaign in Congress. That was 1 million over two years. By comparison, their annual lobbying budget is $12 million. So they care about lobbying 24 times as much. But anyway, the final comments we're gonna see from Keith McCoy has to do with the carbon tax, so here it goes. Nobody is going to, to propose a tax on all Americans. Um, and, 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 and the cynical side of me says, yeah, we kind of know that. Um, but it gives us a talking point that we can say, well, what is Exxon Mobil for? Well, we're for a carbon tax. And why? Because they're confident it'll never happen in America. No, it's not. It's not going. Carbon tax isn't going to happen. And the bottom line is, it's going to take political courage, mm. political will, in order to get something done. And that doesn't exist in politics. It just doesn't. <laughs> I wonder why. I wonder why that doesn't exist. When you have people like that laughing about how they throw up things like a carbon tax that they know isn't going to happen, and they don't want to happen to ward off other changes. And it's not just lobbyists like him, politicians do the same thing talking about it. Now really fast, um, he put out a statement after this saying, I am deeply embarrassed by my comments and that I allowed myself to fall for Greenpeace's deception. 
Decept Dude, you were like so enthusiastic. How cool did you think you were on that call? My statements clearly do not represent ExxonMobil's positions on important public policy issues. While some of my comments were taken out of context, there is no excuse for what I said or how I said it. I apologize to all my colleagues at the company and my friends in Washington DC, all of whom have a right to expect better of me. Like this is some sort of moral failing. Yes, He's describing what them. they actually do. Telling the truth and, is wait, a moral yeah. failing for them. Like this is something that they're just like, wow, I can't believe you did that. Um, you know, I think that the only redeeming quality is that he did these things in hope and in furtherance of getting money, of getting a really great job or something somewhere. So, nope. but yeah, telling the truth, totally not a redeeming quality. Uh, and he'll be fine. He'll be fine, and we'll all move on and we'll forget about it because he yeah. accidentally revealed the truth. And I love anyway. too that Exxon made $181.5 billion in 2020. That's amazing. 2020, when we all suffered. Yeah. Good times. Good times, not for the earth, um, yeah. Okay, we only have a few more minutes. I wanna fit in one more story um, until we have to end the hour. So let's jump into this. Sorry for the director, I know that was abrupt. More bad news out of the legal system, this time for Britney Spears with a judge denying her request to remove her father as co-conservator uh, conservator of her estate. Uh, the decision did come just one week after her testimony about uh, Jamie Spears role as conservator. Uh, but Judge Brenda Penny's ruling was apparently not a result of that hearing in particular and was instead made on a request from last November in which Spears' attorney filed to add Bessemer Trust to serve as co-conservator alongside the singer's father. Uh, CNN reported Tuesday that two sources close to the singer said her attorney is planning to file a petition to terminate the nearly uh, 13 year conservatorship. So it, it's confusing because it certainly seems like it's coming so on the heels of the testimony that it's a direct response to that. Apparently it's not. I wonder though if it's a bad sign for the future for her ability to get out of this entirely, which is certainly the goal. What do you think? I uh, know, I think it's okay. Uh, if this ruling as the court said is based on a previous application it's it's uh that's not necessarily a bad sign since now she has evidence the judge has evidence that could warrant um you know going ahead and terminating that conservatorship but that evidence was not available when that particular petition came before the judge so um i i'd like to think we still have some hope here okay that's interesting look at that well, I want to. We're not going to go through all of what she said in that. We've got a video up on the channel that you should certainly go watch because some of what she revealed is absolutely horrific. Um, but she did say, "I truly believe this conservatorship is abusive. I just want my life back. It's been 13 years, um, and it's enough." And look, it, this is not necessarily a story that I've gotten personally invested in on the show over the past few years all that much. Um, you know, generally, this is like when she's actually come out and talked about it. But it was surprising to me that there was virtually anyone who opposed her push over the past few weeks. And there were people managed to find a, a reason to believe that she's too crazy, she can't take care of herself or whatever. She should just spend the rest of her life dealing with this. And there were some people that were actually pushing for that. Any last thoughts? Uh, I, I think it's unfortunate um, that essentially she's been exploited the way she has and that she can't even control her own body. Uh, it's absolutely wrong. I think it speaks to kind of uh, an underlying issue in our society or not even necessarily underlying in terms of how women are oppressed and subjugated. And the fact that her father is able to make money and capitalize on her to this very day, it's not cool. Yeah, yeah, and, and what you're referencing there, I, I believe is her talking about how she wants to have another kid, but they're effectively not letting her. That's madness. Yeah. How, like, she is a fully grown woman. How do they have any control over all of that? And it's not even like they're just, they're just protecting her, cloistering her away from, they're so exploiting her financially every yeah. day. It's insane. She's pushing 40. It's like, so, if, so what if she wanted to go spend all of her money? It's like, yeah, let her do what she you wants do to do. That. It's her money. Yeah, yeah. If, if I want to go and buy, s'mores with every dollar I have, I get to do that. It's a bad idea and I'll face the repercussions for my wife, but I can do that in theory. She's a grown person, hashtag free Britney. Anyway, that is all the time we're gonna have with our first linear. Thank you to the linear audience. We appreciate you regardless of what platform you're on. 
Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.